Mizraim, a fertile land of rivers and streams, a safe land for refugees, but for Yah's holy seed, it was only a land of bigotry, misery, slavery, captivity for a whole four centuries. In this great land of bondage, the children of Israel grew and bonded. Once the fewest people on earth now could never be stronger. Years after Joseph died, the children of Israel multiplied until they became like the stars of the sky. But fear filled Pharaoh's mind. He didn't want to see us rise. He set up taskmasters to put burden in our lives. Then order for our baby boys to be drowned to their demise. But the waters of the river were nothing compared to the waters of our eyes. And the Most High heard our cries. But one determined Levite mother would do anything to spare the life of her son. She hid him in the home for three months, but she soon realized she couldn't keep him forever. Therefore, she made a basket for the baby to float down the river. As he went down the stream, the daughter of Pharaoh found him and recognized him as a Hebrew. She named him Moses or Moshe, which means to pull out or to draw out of the waters. Moshe is an Egyptian name which shares a similar etymology with the Anishinaabe word Missy or Mizi meaning river or waters. Hence the namesake of the Mississippi River. It means great river in the Anishinaabe language. As Moses grew older, he lived in the house of Pharaoh. But perhaps during his teen years, he came to a full understanding of who he truly was. When he killed an Egyptian for beating an Israelite, then broke up a fight between two Israelite men, he fled away to Midian from the face of Pharaoh who sought to slay him. Now Midian is another Hebrew territory where Ishmaelites dwell. The Midianites were technically a mingled people. They mostly comprised Midianites, but also had traces of the Hivalites, Ishmaelites, and Zimmernites. The Joshpegites, the Midianites, the Ishbegites, and the Shuites. These people were also known as the Arabians of the desert in latter scriptures. This makes sense because Arab means mixed and Midian is in a desert location. Now according to scriptures such as Exodus 3 and 1, we see that Midian borders Horeb, which is the Mojave Desert. Scripture never makes obvious the exact location of Midian, but we know that it is a desert region bordering Horeb. The best spot for this land would be the desert region west of the Mojave Desert and north of present day Los Angeles. When Moses arrived to Midian, he helped some Midianite sisters by a well water their flock. Moses would then go on to marry Zipporah, a Midianite Hebrew who would later be called an Ethiopian in Numbers chapter 3. Now why would a Midianite be called an Ethiopian? This has been a topic for much debate for years, but the only way one can understand this is by completely disregarding the Middle Eastern Biblical map model and focus on the American model. If Midian is truly in Southern California, that would mean it also was located near the country of Havila, the land of onyx, bedellum, and gold. Limestone onyx and calcite onyx can be found in Central California, as well as bedellum extracts from various California incense trees like the elephant trees for example. And we all know that Central California is known for its gold. Havila means whirling circle in Hebrew. It is a fact that before recent damming, Cali had a circular lake in the center which possibly moved in a swirling motion. Now Zipporah, the wife of Moses, was called an Ethiopian simply because she was from the Havila area, and Havila is a Kushite nation. She wasn't an Ethiopian by blood, but by citizenship. Now, like I've stated before, Ishmaelites dwelt in Midian. Therefore, technically, scripture does tell you where Midian is. 
In Genesis 25 and 18, it states that the Ishmaelites dwelt between Havila and Shur, with the land of Shur being in the Baja California Peninsula and Havila being Central California, we could then again conclude that Midian is the desert region of South California between Central California and the Baja California Peninsula. This is the same place mentioned before. As Moses was leading the flock of sheep through the desert of Horeb, he saw a bush which was on fire but not smoking. Moses immediately recognized this as a sign from a higher power. At this point, Moses was chosen to be a deliverer to the children of Israel from the hands of Pharaoh. And Aaron, his brother, will become in charge of speaking to the elders of Israel. The Most High hardened Pharaoh's heart before Moses told him that the Most High commanded for the children of Israel to be set free. The Most High then gruesomely plagued Mizraim every time Pharaoh refused to hearken. The first plague was turning all the streams of the Egyptian river into blood. Could it be possible that this blood was not actual blood, but it was simply infested with a protozoanic algae known as red tide? Red tide is a common occurrence in the Gulf of Mexico, the Gulf of California, and the Colorado River. All of this is the true Red Sea, and the Colorado River is the true original river of Egypt. In fact, the Colorado River is commonly known as the American Nile. Scripture says this bloody water killed all the fish and had an unbearable odor. The smell of actual blood does not smell anywhere near as bad as Red Tide does. Its odor is so bad that its odor will bring you to coughing and even vomiting. Not only that, but once red tide blooms in any body of water, all the fish in the affected area will die simultaneously. Red tide does not at all occur in the African Nile River, and water turning into actual blood would seemingly be a highly renowned event that would have been documented in hieroglyphics However, it was not. Then frogs, then gnats, then flies, then the cattle died, then the Egyptians got boiled in their flesh, then there was fiery hail that fell from the sky, destroying all the high buildings and all the treasure cities of Mizraim. Then Yah sent a strong wind from the east, which brought a black cloud of locusts which was hundreds of miles long and hundreds of miles wide. These locusts then ate up every green thing in Egypt and completely disrupted all the agriculture in the area. This would make perfect sense in America because the original Mizraim was constructed upon the Colorado River Basin in present day Arizona. The now extinct Rocky Mountain locusts lived north and east of that area. An east wind would take the locusts from present-day Texas, Oklahoma, and New Mexico and bring them into Arizona. The Rocky Mountain locusts are actually responsible for the locust plague of 1875. The Rocky Mountain locusts swarmed the west for months at a time. These insects blacken the sky and land on a field or forest and take off within a few hours, reducing any lush area into a complete desert. They then mysteriously went extinct by the early 1900s. No species of locust on earth could wreak as much havoc as the Rocky Mountain locust. The ninth plague was a thick darkness which could be felt. What is it about this darkness that was terribly different? Why was it called thick and how could it be felt? We know that actual darkness cannot be felt so what was this darkness? Scripture does not specify, but many will argue that this darkness was indeed a dust storm, which was caused by the recent desertification that the locusts created. 
This beautiful land of Mizraim of lush plants was reduced to the Arizona landscape that we know today. The final and worst plague is when the firstborn of all living things in Mizraim were cut off from the creeping thing of the ground to the beast of the field and even the fowl of the air and the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat upon the throne. All of these plagues happen only to the Egyptians and not the Israelites. The cast was immediately reversed with this plague. Furthermore, the land of Mizraim became the land of misery for the Egyptians and exuberance for the Israelites. Because before this plague, the Israelites spoiled the Egyptians by taking all of their gold, jewels, and earrings, chains, etc. And the Egyptians had nothing. And Israel left Goshen, which is the area near the mouth of the Colorado River Basin, and fled three days journey into the wilderness. The first major place Israel went was Pharaoh, between Migdal and the sea. This part of the exodus would have taken place in Sonora, Mexico. Allow me to explain. They could have easily went north and got a shortcut into the promised land, but if they would have went north on an American model, they would have to cross the Grand Canyon, which is and was virtually impossible. Therefore, south was the best option. Fijero means place where sedge grows. In Sonora, Mexico, there are more than 100 species of the sedge plant. These plants grow throughout Sonora, Mexico in scattered locations. However, the exact location of Migdal is easier to pinpoint. Migdal means tower in Hebrew. About 10 miles southeast of a city called Magdalena in Sonora, Mexico, there was the oldest tower remains in Mexico. Conquistadors described it as being 750 feet tall and 4,350 feet wide. This tower has never been excavated. Today, it is completely covered by earth. This is the point when the Israelites crossed the Red Sea. This part of the Red Sea would be the Gulf of California. The Red Sea in Hebrew is Yom Suf, which means woolly sea. The sea is called this because of its reeds that grow on the shore. These reeds can be found upon the shore of the California Gulf and the Gulf of Mexico. It could also be called Yom Suf because of its algae, which gives it a red hue. The California Gulf was also called the Red Sea originally in the 1500s, and this title still applies today, hence its present name, Vermilion Sea. Vermilion is one of the brightest shades of red, and on the other hand, the modern Red Sea never got its name until the 1800s. Before this, it was called Sinus Arabicus or the Gulf of Arabia. They probably traveled from Tiburon Island to the Guardian Angel Island during this part of the Exodus. During this time, both islands were connected to their mainlands. Tiburon was connected to Mexico and Guardian Angel Island was connected to the Baja California Peninsula. This is obvious because the island's biology includes snakes, rams, and possums which could not be able to inhabit the islands if they formed any other way. According to Exodus 15 and 22, the first place Israel went after crossing the Red Sea was the wilderness of Shur. Shur means wall in Hebrew. This is the Baja California Peninsula without a shadow of a doubt. This area was called Shur or wall due to the fact that it is a natural barrier from the sea to mainland Mexico. It is literally a wall protecting Mexico from typhoons and tsunamis in the Pacific. In the wilderness of Shur, the children of Israel came to a location known as Mara because of its bitter waters. Then the Most High showed Moses a good tree to cast in the water. This water would later be turned sweet by the tree. Whatever tree this was had to have properties that could take toxins away from the water. 
this tree would have to be a mangrove tree because it is known to filter toxins out of water. The North American mangrove tree grows on the Baja California Peninsula. The bitter waters of Mara could have been any simple river of Baja California or even the Salton Sea which has both fresh and salty properties. It could even have been the Nile Dry Laguna Salida. Now the next area the children of Israel dwelt is a very interesting land because it fits a description closely resembling that of a Western American environment. This is the land of Elim. This area is described as having springs of water and palm trees. If the children of Israel were to leave the Baja California Peninsula going north, they would have to pass through the modern city of Palm Springs, California. This land fits the same physical description as the Hebraic land of Elim. Then after the children of Israel left Elim, scripture says they were back on the shore of the Red Sea. This Red Sea shore had to be the bank of the Colorado River in an American model. This word sea in Hebrew is yam, which is also used for rivers and streams. Thereafter, we pass the wilderness of sin. Sin means thorns and clay in Hebrew. This area fits the Mojave Desert more than any area in the Middle East. The Mojave Desert is a world of red clay and the earth's sharpest cacti thorn. With the understanding of Sinai being the Mojave Desert, finding the location of Mount Sinai is actually so easy, you cannot miss it. Scripture tells us during the days when Israel was in Sinai, the mountain often erupted with smoke and fire, causing the earth around it to violently shake. It is pretty much self-explanatory that Mount Sinai is a very dangerous volcano, which can only be touched and climbed by someone who is as spiritually equipped and protected as Moses was. This mountain today would be Black Mountain Wilderness, California, which is a dormant yet highly powerful volcano. In Exodus 24 and 4, we see that Moses built an altar of stone under the mount. There in Black Mountain Wilderness, there happens to be an altar of unhewn stone under the mountain built just like an ancient Hebrew altar. According to Exodus 17, we see that there was little water in Sinai and the children of Israel were thirsty. Therefore, Moses was given the occasional task of speaking to a rock, which would provide water to an entire nation. This rock was not a stone or boulder, but an actual rock, a small mountain, large enough to give millions of gallons of water to millions of people in the wilderness. This rock gave way to streams which cut through the large crowd of the Israelites, going without saying, this rock sat upon an underground aquifer. The Mojave Desert happens to have a lot of hot springs and groundwater. The modern Sinai Desert does not have this groundwater. However, satellite view image of the Mojave Desert directly south of Black Mountain Wilderness shows a five mile crack in a mountain that clearly portrays the details of dried streams of water that once flowed in all directions. The rock had to pump out enough water to quickly quench the thirst of two million people. And that small rock in the Middle East that biblical archeologists say is the rock of Horeb is nothing more than a weathered rock upon a hill in the desert of Saudi Arabia it definitely would not be able to get the job done. Within the desert of Sin, there was an oasis called Ritma. In Hebrew, Ritma means heath. A heath is a fruitful, uncultivated shrubland and are extremely common in California. In South Central California, we have the California Capero, a shrubland of flowers and trees in South California. It would definitely be logical for them to go through the Caparo if they left the Mojave Desert. The next place Israel passed through was Ramon Perez, which means breach of pomegranates. Although modern historians will have you believe all pomegranates originate 
in the Mediterranean region and were introduced into America by Spaniards. Old Spanish maps call Utah, Nevada, New Mexico, Arizona, and California Granada Nova, meaning new or unknown pomegranates in Latin. And California also happens to be the largest pomegranate producer in the U.S. Another important point to look at is the fact that Central Mexico has its own wild Punica granatum or pomegranates as well. They then pass through Libna, Hebraically, Libna is a land of pavement. Pavement or asphalt derives naturally in volcanic ash. In the northern part of the Mojave Desert, there happens to be a 10 mile long natural distribution of asphalt from a nearby black volcano. After they left Sinai, they dwelt in the wilderness of Paran. Hebraically, Paran means caverns or bowls. This makes sense for the American model because Southern California, north of the Mojave Desert, has many intricate cavern systems. Within Paran, the children of Israel lusted for meat as they remembered Egypt. These ungrateful Israelites who were provided with manna from heaven were then satisfied with the quail that Yah then gave them. Quail just so happens to be an indigenous American animal, especially found in the western side of America. Thus, another perfectly fitting puzzle piece. All the children of Israel who were ungrateful of Yah's heavenly blessing died right then and there in Paran. Yah had killed them for their ungratefulness while the quail's flesh was still between their teeth. Thousands of them died there. This land was called Kabrat Hata Ava, meaning graves of them that lusted. Till this day, archaeologists have found absolutely no trace of evidence concerning the Hebraic Exodus in modern Sinai. Not even one bone was found in the small desert. This area is no bigger than the southern tip of Texas. Its landscape is also very harsh and abrasive. With mountains so close together, it would be impossible for 2.8 million people to simply pass through. 2 million people is a crowd so large it could be seen from space. It was a population in the wilderness like that of Houston, Texas. No ancient skeleton was found in that region. But on the other hand, in Southern California, archaeologists who weren't even trying to find anything beg to differ. Many ancient skeletons were found in Southern California of unknown origins. Let us take a look at the modern Sinai Desert and let's pretend 2.8 million Israelites did pass through the modern Sinai Peninsula during one period of time. Most scholars would say that they went through the southern part of Sinai, the drier, more mountainous part. But people don't realize exactly how mountainous the region truly is. No two mountains in this region are even a mile's distance apart, and it would be completely difficult for one person to cross this land without having to climb a mountain to higher altitude, let alone 2.8 million people. This is even more ridiculous due to the fact that Sinai was not even the wandering part of the Exodus. They were only in Sinai for about two years and spent the remaining time in the wilderness from Seir to Jordan. That amount of people would make a gathering nearly the size of some of the small islands in the Gulf of Mexico. The mountainous region of the peninsula could not realistically support this amount of people. On the other hand, the northern side of the Sinai Peninsula was covered in muddy rivers which flow from the mountainous region. This is a land of quicksand that is very difficult to pass. Although the surface of this land was quite wet, there was still no underground water. This land which we call Sinai today was never a part of an actual Middle Eastern civilization and never had an actual name on ancient maps. 
This land was only a vessel connecting Egypt to modern Palestine. After this, they passed through Rissa, which means moist in Hebrew. This makes sense because directly north of the volcanic asphalt, there is a small accumulation of streams that flow from the mountains east and west. The valley between the mountains is Rissa. From there, they passed the mountains of Shafar, which in Hebrew means beauty. This mountain is any of the mountains east of the valley of Rissa. Perhaps the mountain was Pinto Peak or Telescope Peak, which both look very different from the mountains on the dry, arid surrounding area. Pinto Peak is lush and green, while Telescope Peak is tall and snow-capped. Now, if they kept going east, they would also have to pass Death Valley, which is the single hottest area on the planet. There is absolutely no vegetation in the area, the elevation is one of the lowest on earth, and the sand itself heats up so much it is unbearable to travel on barefoot or with thin shoes. Not only that, but during the night, it is the exact opposite, but equally as dreadful. Temperatures can drop as low as 18 degrees. Unprotected hands and feet will get so cold that you will wish it was daytime. Extreme temperatures are not the only factors that make this area horrifying, but also the point that Death Valley during biblical times was home to enormous giants. If you were one of the Israelites that had to pass through this area, you would most definitely fear for your life. Hence why scripture says, after Israel passed Mount Shafar, they camped at Harada, which means fear or trembling fear in Hebrew. Some Hebrew linguists, however, associate the term harada with the literal quaking of the earth, which still would make perfect sense because Death Valley sits directly above a tectonic fault, which regularly experiences powerful quakes. The most powerful tectonic shock in the area was a magnitude 8.2 quake. After we left Harada, or Death Valley, we enter into the land now known as Nevada. The southern area of Nevada is home to many sweet fruits like gooseberries, grapes, red berries, cherries, and blue and black elderberries. This is another perfectly fitting puzzle piece due to the next two main places Israel passed through in the wilderness, Mithka and Hashmona. Mithka translates to sweetness and Hashmona translates to fatness. Sweetness because of the fruit and fatness because of the thick shrubbery and forestation that once covered southern Nevada. Today the petrified wood and deserts of Nevada indicates that an ancient forest once flourished in the land. Still in Nevada they passed through Ben Jakan which probably means sons of twisting. This location perhaps got its name from the twisting of Nevada State Tree, the bristlecone pine, which grow in accumulation in eastern Nevada. Some of the bristlecone's individuals are the oldest trees still alive on earth, over 5,000 years old. Perhaps the trees were called sons because of the ancient Chaldean belief that when people passed away, they reincarnated as a tree like Asherah and Tammuz, for example. Benjakan is also debated to be translated as sons of Jakan, or being synonymous to Beeroth Benjakan, meaning wells of the children of Jakan. Both of these translations as well make perfect sense in the American model because Jakan is denoted to be a Horite, a descendant of Esau. He is one of the sons of Ezra the Horite, according to 1 Chronicles 1 and 42. Jakan is also known as Akan, meaning he twists in Hebrew, which probably is in reference to his hair. The transliteration of wells of the children of Jakan is highly significant also due to the presence of several natural springs in the area of southern Nevada. 
The next stop for the children of Israel will be Horha Gidgad, meaning conspicuous mountain. The definition of conspicuous is to stand out and be clearly visible, denoting a description of high or prominent height. At our current location of southern Nevada, north and west of the Colorado River, the tallest mountain would be Hayford Peak at 9,924 feet. The land of Horha Gidgad is the area around this region. Still in the wilderness, Israel embarked in a territory which they called Jathabatha, originally spelled Yatawabatha, meaning goodness or pleasantness. This land was good with comparably fertile soil. Southern Nevada is actually pretty arid and dry in present times, but this land actually has several hundred dried streams and lakes, which shows that this land was at one point was very moist and arable. Now about 18 miles northeast of that region, we stumble past one of the main cities of Edom, Ezion Gabar. In Hebrew, this name means backbone of a man, denoting the city had a spinal shaped ridge near it. We also know that it is a port for naval navigation through the Red Sea. And in latter days, Solomon built a fleet of ships in Ezion Gabar to trade with Tarshish. Now, how can a dry desert location in southeast Nevada be a port for ships? Well, we must understand the ancient concept of a sea. When we think of seas today, we think of large bodies of salt water, the ocean basically. However, with an ancient perspective, we see that a sea or yam is in reference to any large flowing body of water, meaning the oceans, the rivers, and the lakes. Now, since rivers connect to oceans, this in a Hebraic sense will make the river a part of the ocean. Rivers too are yam. This would mean the Colorado River is a part of the Red Sea because the Gulf of California is its mouth. The Colorado River before damming and evaporation was enormous, completely navigable, and was large enough to support multiple fleets of ships at a time. There are numerous legends and rumors about ancient ships sailing the Colorado River into the Gulf of California and back. Conquistador Francisco Coronado claimed that Indians told him of ships and sailors that used to navigate the river. Archaeologists have even found pictographs of ships with sails on rocks near the Colorado River, as well as a shield which indicates a warlike people in the area. Some people speculate that these ships and shields are of Viking or Phoenician origin. However, with this train of thought, the ships could also be considered to be Hebrew in origin because the Hebrews traded with the people of Tarshish, Spain, who at the time were Celts, a Viking-like people, and Phoenician seafarers. Scripture says that every three years, Israel traded with Tarshish. The Middle Eastern location of Ezion Gabar is completely illogical due to its position on the Sinai Peninsula. The sole purpose of the port was to connect trade routes between Canaan and Europe. In the Middle Eastern model, the fake Ezion Gabar is located near Iliad on the eastern side of the Sinai Peninsula. In order for ships to go there to Tarshish, aka Spain, they would have to sail south into the Gulf of Aqaba, into the fake Red Sea, into the Indian Ocean, into the Draco Passage under South Africa, then go north past West Africa until passing Morocco into Spain. So basically they would have to go completely around Africa. But the thing is, why would they do that when Solomon could have just built the port in Israel near Gaza? From there they could just go straight through the Mediterranean and get a straight shot into Europe, thus reducing money, time, and energy. An American model what Solomon ships would have to do is sail through the Colorado River into the Gulf of California, into the Pacific, past Central and South America, into the Draco Passage, south of Belize and Argentina, 
then used the Atlantic Ocean's currents as a slingshot into Spain. Sure, that's about the same distance of going around Africa, but still is a lot more logical because Solomon could have picked a better location for his navy in the Middle East. However, in the American model, that would be the best position. This journey in the American model and back would take about six to seven months, a perfect span of time. The modern fake city of Izan Gabar was identified by a German explorer, not certified or historian or archaeologist, but explorer, F. Frank. He claimed that this place was Izan Gabar because of some ruins there that was identified as Solomon's port with no proof. The real ancient city of Zion Gabar is on the Colorado River near the spinal shaped ridge called Weezer Ridge. This ridge actually looks like a human spine, hence why Zion Gabar means backbone of a man in Hebrew. From above and from the ground, it looks like a human spine. Only one mile north of the ridge, near a small stream of the Colorado River, there happens to be a 100 foot structure which seemingly appears to be a man-made object. Due to its flat aerodynamic shape, it could very well be a petrified wooden ship upon a nicely sculpted dock. This object is not at all mainstreamed, in fact the only known photo of the object is on my computer screenshot. It is not a fact that this is an ancient ship wreckage, but all the dimensions fit perfectly to that of a ship. Flat body, narrow at the front, wide at the back, and what appears to be a hollow interior filled with sand from the many dust storms in the area. From examining the shadow of the object upon the rocks, we see that the object is not connected to the rocks beneath it. and is perhaps rounded at the bottom. Just like any successful ship, it has a diameter that can be divided equally and a radius that lines up perfectly with its nose. In other words, it is almost perfectly symmetrical unlike any natural occurring object. These Israelites would then journey from Isaiah Gabar to the mountains of the Ammonites, the mountainous region of Kadesh Barnea. We have now entered into southern Utah. These mountains would range from Mormon Peak to Zion National Park. While in the desert of Zen, the children of Israel thirsted once again. The Most High commanded Moses to speak to a rock for water to come out. However, instead of speaking to the rock, he struck it twice with his staff, which costed Moses his leadership. Moses then sent messengers to the king of Edom to allow passage through their cities. The king refused, yet the children of Israel still made their way to Mount Hor in the border of Edom on one of the red mountains of the border of Edom. There Aaron was buried and Israel mourned for him 30 days. Israel never went directly through Edom, but they went around it by the way of the Red Sea, which is a stream of the Colorado River in this case. On their way, a Canaanite tribe under King Arad attacked them and took many of them captive. Then Israel utterly destroyed those Canaanites and their cities. Although the Most High gave them the power to utterly destroy these people, Israel was so rebellious once again and complained again to the Most High, and the Most High sent poisonous snakes against them, which killed many of them. This species of snake was definitely the Great Basin Rattlesnake, which is an extremely venomous viper whose bite would cause internal bleeding. While still compassing the Red Mountains of the Land of Seir in modern terms would be Red Cliffs National Park, they encompassed the Land of Seir many days. They were then commanded to turn north along the Red Sea which again in this case was a stream of the Colorado River. This is when they began to wander. In the mountainous land of eastern Utah, they wandered for about 38 years before they made it past the Jordan River. The first place they wandered to was Zalmona. 
In Hebrew, Zalmona means shady or gloomy. This is because the land northeast of the red land of Seir is a land of ash-like dark gray soil. The same is for the next location, Punan, which means darkness. The first land, Zalmona, was the area around Black Knoll, a black hill north of Seir, and north of Punan is the land of Black Mountain, a black mountain peak. As the children of Israel continued north, they made war with more and more Ammonite tribes who came against them, slew them by the edge of the sword, and leaving their cities in heaps and ruins. The next two cities they passed through they made war with the people and left their cities heaps and rubble, both Em and Asia Abrim. Then Moses gave Gad, Reuben, and Manasseh the lands of the Amorites and Bashan. Then still continuing north, they wasted Dibon, and the children of Gad rebuilt it and called it Dibon Gad. From Dibon Gad, the children of Israel migrated to the mountains of Abarim, which is most definitely the Salt Creek mountain range. These mountains were south of Mount Nebo, so Mount Nebo is in its correct location even on the Mormon's American model. From there they migrated to a plain near the land of Moab. This plain would definitely be the three modern utopian cities of Levon, Nephi, and Mona. This plain is a relief because it is among the most fertile areas in this part of Utah and the ancient city of Jericho was somewhere around this region. The children of Israel could not pass through the land of Moab because the king of Moab would not allow them through, so they walked on the outskirts of the land. They then crossed the Zered River, which is the now Dam Deer Creek, and after that they had to cross the Arnon River, which is also the now Dam River that flows into Ogden Bay, once a part of the Salt Sea. And finally they crossed the Jordan River, which was flooded during this time of the year. And Bear River, the river which they would cross, is known for its flooding in spring and fall. The Bear River is the Jordan. The entire congregation of Israel stood near the banks of the Jordan River, including the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant. Since the river was flooded, the Most High split the river for passage, just as he did the Red Sea. Then they grabbed 12 stones from the riverbed as a memorial. The children of Israel then entered into the land which Yah had given them. They followed Joshua, for he was the new leader of the house of Israel. The older generation of the Israelites who came out of Egypt had all died in the wilderness, including Moses, who died near Moab. Before Moses died, however, he gave all the laws Yah had gave him to write to Joshua. Then Joshua gave them to the priest and then told Joshua to lead the people. Yah led Moses from the plain of Moab to the peak of Mount Nebo and Pisgah. From 12,000 feet above the plain of Moab, Moses could see all the promised land. However, he could not die there, for he died in the land of Moab. He died at a good age. 101 years old, and he was buried by Yah himself in a location that no man knows. Now the children of Israel entered into their promised land and were circumcised again. But the final obstacle for these people was conquering the Canaanites and dividing their land into portions for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. See, I never let the Pharaoh 
I never ever liked the Pharaoh. Now there arose up a new king up over Egypt. He knew not the fame of Joseph and all he did they exceeded. Through vision, interpretation, they grew and they gained fame. Yet still in all their counsel, they chose to put us in chains. So Pharaoh, oh yes he did, set over us taskmasters to afflict us with their burdens and rigorous cruel ways. Despite of them throwing shade, we grew exceedingly great. The commandment from the king was every male child should be slain. All the midwives went they way and did not that which was decreed uh -huh. All praises go to you God for the fear they had for thee And Pharaoh's men they inquired like women what have you done They said we women be Hebrews y'all commanding the wrong ones We worship the one true God, Egyptians worship the sun Notwithstanding through our bondage of mediators to come So when patience possess your soul, I know you seriously grieve Be grateful at where you are and let this See, I never liked the Pharaoh. I never ever it's liked the Pharaoh. Now there arose up a new king up over Egypt He knew not the fame of Joseph and all he did they exceeded Through vision, interpretation, they grew and they gained fame Yet still in all their counsel, they chose to put us in chains So Pharaoh, oh yes he did, set over us taskmasters To afflict us with their burdens and rigorous cruel ways Despite of them throwing shade, we grew exceedingly great The commandment from the king was every male child should be slain all the midwives went they way and did not that which was decreed uh -huh. All praises go to you God for the fear they had for thee And Pharaoh's men they inquired like women what have you done They said we women be Hebrews y'all commanding the wrong ones We worship the one true God Egyptians worship the sun Notwithstanding through our bondage of mediators to come So when patience possess your soul I know you seriously grieve Be grateful at where you are and let this strip in your butt